but that's such so key it's like this 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 empowerment mm -hmm. like like from from encountering a frustration and learning what we don't know and we suddenly understand what we don't know because before that incident he did not know what he didn't know Mm -hmm. right? right but then he learned oh i didn't know that and then he felt he can do something and that's the process of empowerment mm -hmm. but i was just really i really like the story you shared just before the recording about the jar of the flea oh yeah you put the flea in the jar and keep a lid initially the flea would jump but very quickly the flea learned you could never jump too high so even you remove the lid, the flea was still like bouncing mildly in there. And I feel maybe this is a part that Anne can share more is I feel for a lot of Asian kind of uh, population, <laughs> Asian people, we have transgenerational learned helplessness. It's not just one lifetime of the flea, it's our parents, our ancestor already been put in the jar for thousand years and so that sense of helplessness is so strong um, but that's also how I feel when I work with um, people who suffer more severe mental illness like a schizoaffective disorder or other more like you know more prevalent chronic condition it's like they become the flea and then they lost the, the empowerment and they're not too much um, opportunity for, for empowerment I think a lot of that still goes back to, you know, even the term that we use, post-traumatic growth, it goes back to that growth-oriented mindset, that mm -hmm. pro sense of progression. And when you encounter um, some sort of crises, right, it's like, this is an opportunity for growth. Am I going to engage in it? Am I going to leap into it? I don't know so much of whether the Chinese culture has that lid imposed on it. I still think it goes back to class because, you know, depending on the different class. The um, socioeconomic class, yeah. Right, the parenting is different and yeah. even yeah. what they've been told, it's, this is not your horizon. This mm -hmm. is part of it, but there's another horizon. In order to achieve that horizon, you need to meet this expectation. So that's so much of their conditioning. So I still think it goes back to class, um, mm -hmm. what, where we place that lid. But certainly there are certain things that we place that lid on. And what we said earlier was our physicality, um, not taking too much risk mm -hmm. or containing the physical risk that we take. That's a huge part of the Chinese culture. We're mm -hmm. always coaching children and praying for them to be ping ping and and, mm -hmm. and everything is just smooth sailing and just keeping it safe always keeping it safe but you know it's not like that here all of my kids that i see as clients they're constantly climbing on trees i mean i had very recently a, a woman in her 40s she fell off of a tree and that was a physical trauma that she endured, but she got up and she had other things to engage. I mean, part of it could be there are more trees here. I think that's one. But parents just don't have this mentality. Don't climb on that tree. Parents caution against it, but kids will climb on it anyways. It's part of the culture. So it's not uncommon to see a kid with a cast on their leg or their arm from some sort of trauma, some sort of sports injury, or some sorts of just testing their physical limitations and engaging in the world in a physical way. And then they come back from it and they have early experiences of that. But your, your comments also, um, you know, kind of uh, trigger for me conversations we've had about relationships. Mm -hmm. That also within Chinese culture, that having doors that match. Remember how you taught me about the doors that match socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we start looking at safe relationships and not taking risk in relationship. And that that too is its own jar. So it that perpetuates. Yeah, it perpetuates. So that if a child in school or even, you know, a college student in college is not willing to engage 
some area uh, of, of knowledge or something that is scary to them. They just try and keep it simple or they just try and go along with the program. They get only what the program offers. It takes getting outside that jar to actually create and build something greater than. But also if you're trying to transcend a socioeconomic class, you've got to at some point get venture out of that socioeconomic class to find out how everybody else in the new class lives. Yeah. What their value set is. Whichever direction. Whichever direction. Yeah. And, so and I think of both directions, understanding of both directions are really important. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I think part different of that. Because different have different type of resiliency. Correct. Yeah. And, and I think, too, the one thing that keeps people stagnant in one area is a fear of poverty, actually. When you look at a middle class person, mm -hmm. they're more afraid of poverty than they are aspiring to go up. Right. And so having an experience with people that are actually poor and living among them and engaging them in conversation and seeing that really, you know what, poverty is, is uh, survivable. Okay, so now I don't have to fear it so much. And now that I stop fearing poverty, I can start aspiring to um, greater capability in socioeconomic status or, or you know, whatever. And I think that it, it's all analogous to ch actually challenging ourselves. That if we challenge ourselves on a daily basis, mm -hmm. um, then when life's challenges come, we're used to meeting challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I feel that's so important. And I feel like there, there's a great hope in Taiwan because I just got to know this group of young people. They're all under 30. And then three years ago, they created this social entrepreneur kind of a company. And one of the game they design is actually learning from the poverty. So they actually, you can enroll as a group. So it's like a monopoly, but the opposite one. And then you literally play that on the street in the, uh, in, in Taipei, Wanhua, Mengjia. Neat. Yeah, so, so they did exactly what Roger just described is to bring the middle upper class people. They can come as a group and then learn and experience. What, it, what does it feel like if you got a car, you, you were assigned a role as a street vendor, or you are a laborer, like you can only um, uh, work part-time, and then you have a lot of other limitations, physical or psychological or social limitations. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and experience that for a half day for, or a day or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because one thing that I do see is um, it's kind of sad because I think as 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 a whole island or even as the whole region, um, I think Asian countries are continuously encountering big environmental stress, and some of the stress I would say is traumatic level. Or, or, or it's like very insidious tra traumatic stress. And, and so, so I see that sometimes people cope with that by what Anne just described. You just need to learn how to be ping, ping, an, an. Just play the safety card, right? So people continuously try to figure out what's the rule. If we can follow the rule, we can get a point we can get a hundred percent of that, then we'll be safe. It's kind of um, like the flies not having to fly too high so they don't keep on hitting the lid. Exactly, exactly. And so, but, but, then, but then I feel like the younger generations, a lot of them or some of them started to say, hey, that would not help us to survive or even to thrive. We need to learn how to develop the resiliency and we need to do something different.